Welcome to Bedside Manor by Gas Station Jack. We were a thousand miles from home when my car gave up the ghost. To be honest, I was surprised we made it as far as we did. My old Nissan had been on life support for the better part of the last decade. Now that it was dead, I almost felt relief. Like the old machine could finally be at peace in the great afterlife in the parking lot in the sky. Of course, that relief was easily outweighed by my newfound panic being stranded in the middle of unfamiliar nowhere. Jerry was under the hood trying to do some sort of dark magic to get the engine up and running again, while I paced the road with my cell phone held over my head, hoping for a single bar of connectivity and feeling about as useful as male nipples. This certainly wasn't the highlight of our cross-country road trip, but it wasn't the worst moment either. That particular honor fell upon the roadside marsupial petting zoo. To be fair, this was taking my mind off of all those things I'd left back home, which was the entire purpose of this vacation after all. That's why my friends called it a surprised vacation. Their delicate phrasing conjured a much kinder image of what turned out to be a low-key kidnapping. I got home from my overnight shift to find all of them waiting for me in my living room, intervention style. My roommate Jerry, their mastermind behind it all, had two go bags waiting by the front door, and a mat plotting our impending road trip to see the Pacific Ocean for the first time in my life. Jerry had been prone to these spontaneous, well-intended, but highly irresponsible gestures for just about as long as I'd known him. At least this time, he didn't try to gift me a stray animal that he found. Normally, I would simply say thank you and have to shut it down before things got out of hand. But I wasn't really in the proper headspace to fight back. I had just gone through what can only be described as a traumatic event. Some people close to me died, there was a major misunderstanding with the new sheriff, but that's probably better for another day. Suffice to say my friends saw what I was going through as a rough patch, and thought it would be good medicine to get me far away from everything for a few days. They made sure that my shifts at the gas station were covered until the end of the week, just long enough for things to get settled down and back to normal. I couldn't blame them for not understanding what was really going on. Hell, I only had a tenuous grasp of it myself, but the doctors assured me everything would be fine now, as long as I just stuck to the plan and took my medicine. After a few long days filled with tourist traps, roadside attractions, cheap motels, and car farts, it looked like we'd finally reached the end of our adventure. We were a few states away from the west coast, but we were low on money and even lower on time. The trip was about as close to a success as we were likely to ever get, but the car's breakdown was the final straw. I decided to give Jerry a few more seconds of vacation before breaking the news to him which is why I was taking so long looking for cell service, when I knew there was going to be none out there. When I got back to the car, Jerry popped his head under the hood and said, Okay, try the engine now. I turned the key. Nothing but the sound of stubborn silence. Nada, I announced. Really? Fuck a doodle. I bypassed the ignition switch. It's not the battery or the starter. The spark plugs look good, the fuses are good, the wiper blades are new, and blinker fluid is full. Maybe it's out of gas, I offered, exhausting the full extent of my vehicular knowledge. Nah, still got half a tank. He slammed the hood shut and said, Well, I'm gonna go make friends with the tree. When I get back, I'll start taking the engine apart. In the meantime, you should build a fire and find something to cook. We may be out here a while. That plan isn't gonna work. Relax, dude. It's just an expression. I'm not really gonna make friends with the tree. He scoffed. <laughs> if anything, I'm going to give the tree a really good reason to be mad at me. I meant we can't just set up camp hoping for a miracle for a friendly passerby. I mean, what are the odds a good Samaritan is going to take the same shortcut we did? I was not trying to be mean, but he was the one who discovered this brilliant alternate route between highways over an hour ago. And in that time, we hadn't seen a single car beside our own. Our path had been nothing but acre after acre of farmland and trees. And of course, there was that enormous house back at the top of the hill. All right, Jerry said. What's the plan then? Did you clock that spooky house we passed about a mile ago? He laughed. How could I not? It was so extra. 
It wasn't wrong. The place stuck out like a pink bikini at a Mormon funeral. Unlike traditional farmhouses and double wides that decorated most of the adventure through the back roads of the American South, this place was a certifiable mansion. A mix between Greek revival and Gothic architecture, including spires, columns, even a widow's walk. I wouldn't have been surprised to see a gargoyle or two hanging off of the roof. And I would bet my last dollar the place was haunted. It was one thing for certain. It was a kind of place I would love to avoid at all costs. <sighs> I think we need to go there, I said, regrettably. Jerry eagerly agreed. He relieved himself on the side of the road. I went to the car's trunk and grabbed a few necessities for the walk up the hill. A bag of trail mix, a bottle of water, and some sunscreen. It wasn't going to take us very long, but not very long was exactly long enough for me to burn. Poor preparation had kicked my ass too many times lately. Jerry must have had a similar thought. He came up next to me and reached under our bags, pulling the baseball bat from its hiding place. Uh, what's that for? I asked. Protection. Duh. There could be wolves out there. No, dude. No weapons. I don't want to show up at a stranger's home looking any more suspicious than we already do. Oh, uh, yeah. Good point. He tossed the bat inside and slammed the trunk shut. I think we had everything we needed. I thought we were being smart by leaving the weapon behind. In retrospect, it was the first of many bad decisions. It took a half hour to get to the top of the hill, another five minutes just to walk up the winding driveway through the meticulously manicured lawn. When we finally reached the enormous double doors, I was too exhausted to even feel nervous anymore. Jerry knocked while I fished, unsuccessfully, for cell reception. Who do you think lives here anyway? He asked. Some kind of supervillain? The king of the farmer folk? The Munsters? If I had a guess, probably the kind of people whose family used to own people. The door opened. I quickly remembered how to feel nervous again. Can I help you? An old woman croaked in a voice that sounded like paper tearing. She was a little over four feet tall and dressed like a Victorian era doll. Gray hair tied behind in a cloth bonnet. Bristly nose hairs. Skin the color of canned meat spread and the thickest pair of wireframe glasses that I had ever seen, magnifying her pupils to the size of quarters. To put it bluntly, she was difficult to look at. I nearly dropped my phone, but Jerry didn't even flinch. He just tipped an imaginary hat and said, Hello there, ma'am. My name is Jerry. This is my associate, Jack. We hate to be a bother, but our vehicle broke down up the street, and we were wondering if it might be possible to... I wasn't expecting any more company, she interrupted. Are you sure you're at the right address? Jerry and I shared a look. No, ma'am, he said. I was saying that our car stopped working out of the blue. We're stranded on the side of the road. Jack here is a nervous Nelly, so we decided all the guests have been accounted for, she said, her voice registering somewhere between a creaky door and an angry drill sergeant. You must check your invitations, please. Jerry took a breath and rubbed his hands together. Is there... Someone younger we could talk to. Jerry, I snapped. Relax, dude. I don't even think she could hear us. I pushed him out of the way. I stepped up to the feeble old woman and looked her right in her magnified pupils. Excuse me, I said gently. We need to use your phone, please. She tilted her head up, then back down, presumably giving us the look of a once-over. Then she turned around and said, Follow me this way to the telephone machine. Local calls only, no long distance, please. She disappeared into the bowels of the ancient manor. I hesitated. A feeling, a familiar feeling, washed over me. One I could neither trust nor ignore. A feeling of dread. An unshakable sense that something was wrong here. Only this time it felt stronger. It felt realer. Before I could comprehend what was happening, Jerry had already marched past me into the dark entryway leaving me alone with my paranoia. I took a breath, and I powered after them. The short elderly woman spoke in a dry, monotone voice as we followed her past the entryway into this enormous great hall that wouldn't have looked out of place in the first deck of the Titanic. I was only halfway listening, but I picked up enough to understand that she was reciting the house's history, like some kind of tour guide. The house was built in 18-something-something by Colonel someone-someone, it began as a plantation. I fucking knew it. 
and then served as a hospital for the Civil War, or as she worded it, the War of Northern Aggression. As her words droned on, the interior of the manor was busy telling me its own story. The hardwood floors with century-old claw marks, the enormous painting hanging over the fireplace with a man with sideburns and an I dare you to grimace, a suit of armor, a bearskin rug, a crystal chandelier. I half expected a diamond billboard sign reading, we have old money so fuck you. The air smelled of tobacco and old books. Voices muffled from very far away transferred through the walls. There was a jovial nature to them, some laughter even. The place was alive with people, at least that's what I hoped I was hearing. At the grand staircase there was a thin door, the woman opened it, revealing a much less impressive set of steps leading down into the basement. She descended and Jerry followed. I considered the wisdom of staying put right in the sight of the exit just in case I needed to make a break for it. I looked over my shoulder to make sure the door was, you know, still there. Not that it would really do much good though. If things went south again, I knew I wouldn't make it very far on my own. When I turned toward the basement, it was already too late to tell them to stop or wait. I looked back at the exit. I was stranded. You know, it's remarkable, really, that even with my attention being pulled in such opposite extremes, I somehow managed to notice a shelf of books along the wall by the fireplace. And even more remarkable, how I gravitated toward them, almost unwillingly. How time stood absolutely still. I forgot where I was for only a moment, but in that moment, I must have pulled a book out and began reading it. It had been ages since I let myself relax and get lost in a good story. Wait a minute, what the hell am I reading? Time snapped back into place around me. How, how long have I been standing here? I was already over a chapter and a half in. I closed the book and inspected it. The Basilisk Stare. It was an Agatha Christie mystery that, somehow, I'd never heard of. Strange, I thought I had read all that she had written. How did this one escape my radar? All at once, I became aware of an unsettling presence. A looming shadow. The same feeling you get when a cop starts trailing you on the interstate. I put the book back where it belonged and then turned around and confirmed my suspicion. I was no longer alone standing there. The young woman silently watching me for how long I don't know, but I was willing to give her the benefit of the doubt that she wasn't Edward culling me the entire time. She wore a light blue formal dress, one that looked like it had been plucked straight out of the 19th century, complete with a hoop skirt and white elbow length gloves. She was about my age, assuming she wasn't a ghost or a vampire of course, with these piercing blue eyes and black hair and ringlets, framing a heart shaped face. In her hand, she held an old book, the cover worn down enough to obscure the title. She didn't say anything. She didn't smile or nod. She just stood there quietly staring. I thought this behavior was a little weird, until I realized I was guilty of doing the exact same thing. I managed to get out the words, oh, and hi, in that order. Her gaze turned momentarily from the bookshelf then back to me. Her voice was barely more than a whisper. You're like me, aren't you? I didn't answer right away. I didn't know how to answer. Part of me deep down wanted to say yes, but I couldn't understand why. What do you mean? When she spoke again, her voice had a little more heart. There's something wrong with you. The way she said it carried no malice. It was just an innocent statement, and I gave an honest response. Yeah, how'd you know? Her next question made the hairs on the back of my neck stand at attention. The weird stuff, does it follow you too? I looked around to make sure we were still alone before answering. I don't know yet. This way, please. The old woman had returned. Despite the word please, I could tell it was more of a command than a request. The girl with the piercing blue eyes stepped in front of me, shelved her book, and then walked away without another word. This time, the old woman descended the stairs, and I was quick to follow. The sooner we got a call to a mechanic, the sooner we could leave this place forever. The underground room smelled exactly how I would expect an underground room to smell. Musty and damp. 
A single bare incandescent bulb hung from the ceiling, illuminating our surroundings. A broken grandfather clock against the far wall, an industrial washer-dryer combo, cardboard boxes stacked to the ceiling, and an eight-foot-tall taxidermied polar bear that begged the question, how the hell did they get that down here in one piece? Jerry already had the receiver of the corded phone between his ear and his shoulder when I walked in. His hands held the yellow phone book. Alrighty, bud. Thanks. Yeah, you too. He looked at me with a strange expression. His mouth formed a smile, but his eyes were saying, You're not going to like what I have to tell you. What is it? I asked. He put the phone book down on the table, cradled the receiver, took a deep breath, and then answered slowly. I've got good news and bad. You know I hate this game, right? The mechanic said he knows exactly where we are and he's sending out his tow truck. But... But... He won't be able to get to us before morning. Then we try someone else. Yeah, about that. He's the only mechanic in the entire county. Oh, did he tell you that? He's the only mechanic listed in the phone book. He... What? How is that even possible? I stepped over to the table and picked up the book. I immediately opened to the page for mechanics. If I weren't so paranoid, I might not think anything about it, but the fact that it fell directly open to that exact spot that I was looking for registered as less as serendipitous as more as a giant red flag, enough to propel a sailboat. I sighed once I saw that he was right. A single entry under Mechanics Automotive. I put the book away and said, It's fine, we could stay one night in the car, we've survived a lot worse. I nearly jumped out of my skin when the old lady began to speak. I'd honestly forgotten that she was still there. If this is what it must be, I will not begrudge any travelers some safe shelter for a night. There's a spare room available on the third floor. The Woodrow Harpa Suite. Oh no, I said. We couldn't possibly accept such an imposition. Jerry made a noise that sounded like a quack. Uh, yeah we can. What are you talking about? She insisted. It's no imposition at all. My family has been blessed with the fruits of good fortune. It's only right that we extend our hospitality to those in need. However, there is one condition which I must insist. No, really, I said. It's okay. No, really, Jerry echoed. Did you say sweet? I had a bad feeling in my gut, growing stronger by the second. Jerry, do you mind if I talk to you in private for a moment? He followed me into the far corner, below the watchful eyes of the dust-covered bear. I don't like it, I whispered. There's something wrong here. Something not quite right about this place. It doesn't make sense. Crick, 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 crick. For a flashing instant, I swear to God I saw something crawling up the wall next to us. Upon closer inspection, I realized that there was nothing there. My mind does have a tendency to play tricks. Jerry didn't bother with the inside voice. Yeah, I know it's creepy as fuck, but Grandma over there hardly strikes me as a murder cannibal. I'm reasonably certain that if push came to shove... We could probably take her. I looked over my shoulder to see if Grandma had heard us. If she had, her face sure didn't show it. I turned back to Jerry and continued. It's not her I'm worried about. Then what is it? I took a second to try to find the answer, but I realized I didn't know. I shrugged. Hey, it's cool, Jerry said. If you're getting bad vibes, we can piece right out of here. But let me ask you this. If your gut is correct, if something is wrong... Do you really think we'll be any safer waiting out by the car? He did have a point. Whatever was triggering my nope radar could probably follow us a mile down the road. But if we did go back to the Nissan, I could at least spend the night with a baseball bat in my hands. The old woman's patience must have finally ran out. As she turned to the stairs, called over her shoulder, Follow me this way, I'll show you to your room. Jerry read the look on my face and he tried to pump the brakes. Actually, we're just going to rough it in the car tonight. No need to show us. Oh, look, she's already gone. We hurried up the stairs behind her. When we had all re-emerged on the ground floor, she started toward the grand staircase, but Jerry and I took a different route, headed straight toward the front door. But just before I could reach the handle, the lights flickered. A booming noise filled the room, freezing us in place. The sound of a distant explosion lingered for a couple of seconds, then dissipated. If I didn't know better... I would have thought it sounded like thunder. I broke free from my deer in the headlights moment and opened up the door to see that the sky outside had turned to a murky black. Waves of thick torrential rain was rocking the trees on the horizon, like hands frantically waving goodbye to the world. 
I had been through enough tornadoes to know that this is what bad weather looked like. But this? This was something different. A bolt of lightning cracked open a tree on the other side of the road. Half a second later, the noise washed over us. I instinctively stepped back and shut the door. Jerry laughed. I guess that settles it, huh? Looks like we're hunkering down here for the night whether we like it or not. It appears the looming tempest has finally caught up with us. Once again, the old woman snuck up on me, revealing her presence when she spoke. I turned to her. She showed no signs of concern, not a smile nor a frown. No emotion at all, really. She just stood there and waited for me to say something, which, after finally finding my voice again, I did. You said there was one condition to our staying the night. Yes, she answered. As you have undoubtedly discovered by now, this is no ordinary bed and breakfast. Typical reservation is made a full year in advance. Experience of the night at the bedside manor is quite valuable, in more ways than one. If you will be present, I expect you to behave as legitimate guests. That means engaging in all the evening's activities, exploring out the various mysteries, and staying in character. And above all else, she raised her voice to emphasize this next part, you must not let any of the other participants know you did not pay for a room. Is this understood? Clear as mud, Jerry answered. Excellent. Now please follow me to your accommodations. Her explanation was way too much for me to digest all at once. Activities. Bed and breakfast. Character. She continued to speak as we followed her up the grand staircase. Further from safety? Of the outside. Bedside Manor contains 13 bedrooms, 5 for guests, 3 for family, and additional 5 for the servants. At one point, it was considered quite progressive to allow the help to live in the main quarters, and Eustace, besides, saw it as an exercise in practicality. Keep your friends close and your workers closer. I hung back a few steps and caught Jerry at a safe whispering distance. That storm really came out of nowhere. It's a cloudburst, he said with a shrug. They happen. I got sunburned walking up the hill. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. Good thing we got here when we did, huh? He really wasn't taking the hint. Yeah, I said, resigning myself to the situation. Good thing. The old woman reached the top of the landing and waited silently for us to catch up. When we were together again, she continued the monologue, explaining the sordid history of the generations of the bedsides like it was somehow relevant to the plot or something. And I wasn't really paying attention. I just assumed Jerry would be listening so he could fill me in later. Before we knew it, we were standing beside a reddish-brown door with a mercury knob and a brass nameplate above the frame of the wood that read Woodrow Harper, 1846-1857. to Do you have any questions for me at this time? She asked. Is there a Wi-Fi password? Jerry asked. Bedside Manor offers a full experience in the immersion of a simpler time. We have neither computers nor television machines, save for emergencies. The telephone will be unavailable to anyone during the course of their stay. I asked the next question. What did you say your name was? My name is Margaret, Margaret Bedside, but you may call me Maggie. Thank you, Maggie. She offered us a key, and a strange apology. I'm sorry, I'm afraid there's only one bed in the Woodrow Harper suite. I took the key and replied, that won't be a problem. She looked at me as if she wanted to say something, but didn't. Instead, I'll leave you two to get cleaned up. Please feel free to use any clothing you find in the armoire. Dinner begins at 7 shop. There will be a social event and a mingling at 6. I expect to see you both there. With that, she turned and shuffled back toward the stairs. The room was, in a word, magnificent. There was a king-sized bed with its own curtains. A separate sitting area by the bookcase. Even a crystal chandelier. I try to keep a calm voice. Jerry, what is your understanding of the situation we're finding ourselves in right now? Isn't it obvious? No, not at all. Dude, check it. This is a murder mystery themed bed and breakfast. He could barely contain his excitement. I've always wanted to try one of these. Come again? He started exploring the room like a kid in a candy shop. It's like an escape room mixed with a dinner theater. Here's what's going to happen. Somebody is going to die tonight. Then we get to spend the weekend playing detective. There's a reason everything here and looks and feels so creepy. It's by design. Old Maggie's probably just an actress. 
This is going to be awesome. He rushed into the bathroom, then excitedly called out, They got a bidet and toilet paper. How fancy do you feel right now? Because I'm feeling monocle fancy. I approached the window overlooking the front of the property. At the rate, the surprise storm was really churning along. It couldn't go on for much longer. Eventually, the sky had to run out of water, right? You are aware that we can't stay here overnight, aren't you? We don't have any of our stuff. We don't have clothes. I left my medicine in the car, and I can't afford to skip another dose after what happened last time. I thought about it for a moment. Earlier, at the bookshelf. About the lost time. And then I thought about the girl with the blue eyes. Jerry soon interrupted my train of thought, returning into the room, wearing a silken bathrobe around his neck like an oversized scarf. Yeah, I haven't forgotten about that, he said. I'll tell you what. When the storm clears, we can pull an Irish goodbye. But in the meantime, let's see if this wardrobe comes with a complimentary Narnia portal. He opened up the double doors to the armoire, took a step back and whistled. <whistles> what is it? Hey Jack, what size do you wear? I don't know. Medium? Why? I crossed the room to see the old piece of furniture had two complete tuxedo sets, formal wear with tails and top hats. No thank you. Shoes and bow ties. Exactly two sets. At a glance, they seemed like they would be pretty close to Jerry and my sizes. The pull-out drawers beneath contained socks and underwear. The bathroom contained two unopened toothbrushes. Jerry showered up first. When he was done, he tried on his clothes just to find they fit perfectly. After my shower, I wasn't even surprised to see that every piece had been tailored specifically for me. Coincidences abound but even Jerry had to admit it was a little too lucky. Everything about this room felt like they had been expecting us. Sorry for my hiatus. Things have got pretty crazy there in the past uh, few months or so, but hopefully, and I do mean hopefully, I can start cranking these videos out more regularly. Please do all that algorithmic stuff YouTube enjoys, like liking, sharing, all that. Make sure you're subscribed. And leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Can't wait for the next one. Thank you to all the patrons who support the channel. I appreciate it.